Today, I'm here with Anita Posh, who's a Bitcoiner based in Austria. She has a Bitcoin podcast, and she did the German language translation for Andreas Antonopoulos' book, The Internet of Money. Anita, thank you for joining us. How are you today? Hi, Ricardo. Thanks for having me. I'm fine. Thank you. I hope you too. Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you. <laughs> Anita, my first question for you is going to be, what is the Bitcoin uh, scene like in Austria? And how does it compare to countries like Germany and Switzerland that have large and very active Bitcoin communities? Yeah, I mean, I think we also have a rather large community here. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the Austrian Bitcoin Association uh, was founded already in 2011. Um, that was even two years before uh, the, the Swiss um, Bitcoin Association and the, the Bundesverband in Germany. And um, in 2014 or something, by the time the Austrian Financial Authority declined uh, jurisdiction for Bitcoin in Austria, so in the early days. And that was the reason why actually some uh, German uh, startup founders came to Austria uh, who were known actually as like regulation refugees. <laughs> and um, the first Bitcoin broker in Austria was founded in 2014. That was uh, or is still Coinfinity. And we have Bitpanda in Vienna. Bitpanda is uh, the first Austrian unicorn. Um, they also were founded in the same year. And in Vienna, what's also interesting is we have the house of Nakamoto, which is a, a store where you can like walk in and ask your questions about Bitcoin. And they also have a, a Bitcoin ATM. Yes. And the Bitcoin Austria, the, the nonprofit uh, organization where I'm also part of the, the, the board, we are doing, I mean, not in COVID times, but usually uh, we're doing regular Bitcoin meetups where people can come, ask their questions. We're doing talks and connecting, connecting people. Um, I actually didn't know that Austria had such a long history with Bitcoin. You mentioned Austria's uh, regulatory, uh, financial regulatory board. What's the regulatory stance like towards Bitcoin? Are they pretty accepting of it or is it pretty controlled? Um, it's both in a way. So it's controlled, but it's also accepted. And we have regulations in plan, in, 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 uh, in order, uh, working regulations. And there's also a sandbox. So basically authorities are working together with startups um, who want to do projects. And um, that means the on and off ramps are regulated. So if you want to exchange from Euro to Bitcoin, then you have to do KYC. Otherwise, you have to go to one of the decentralized platforms, uh, which you can go like online. Uh, but everything here is um, basically the on and off ramps are regulated. And, um, and you need no license if you have a Bitcoin ATM. It depends on your business model. So actually, we have clearer regulations here as uh, compared to Germany. In Germany, you have... I think only two or three Bitcoin ATMs. And sometimes they are also um, people, a, comp a company from Austria um, is, is uh, offering them in Germany because their regulation is so unclear and, and bad against Bitcoin that um, many people from the German borders come to Austria and go to Bitcoin ATMs here. Okay, yeah, I've actually heard that about Germany, that it's, it's very, very difficult to start a Bitcoin ATM because of the regulatory burden and the cost of getting the permits and, and all that kind of stuff. Are Bitcoin ATMs um, pretty common in Austria then? Like you can yeah. find one in any major city? Uh, I did look at the map, but I know that um, if you look at Coin uh, Map coinmap.org yeah um we are the fourth place on the fourth place like in the numbers of a bitcoin atm so first it's it's united states then canada then united kingdom and the next one is austria so we have 157 uh, atms and i mean compared to the size of the country uh, this number is very uh, big and i think it's interesting because I think that's, that's a reason for that is because we were so early and we have some uh, founders and people who got early into Bitcoin and were like not only enthusiastic, they were active, you know, building stuff. And so we also have um, 
products like vouchers for Bitcoin. So you can buy something that's called Bitcoin bone at every tobacconist or petrol station in Austria. Um, there's another product called uh, Bitcoin to go that's from Bitpanda. They are in every uh, post office in Austria. And um, so there's a lot of adoption, it seems. I don't know actually why. Um, but also um, we have merchants and restaurants taking uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Uh, a company called Salamantex is offering uh, point of sale integrations. So yeah, and also some fun things, you know, like there's a bee master in, in Vorarlberg uh, who is having like a, a, a honey pie <laughs> where he, he's um, selling his honey um, for Bitcoin only. In Austria, is, is mining still profitable or is electricity too expensive? Um, how are people typically getting their coins? In the early days, most or many people were mini mining as long as it worked on their uh, computers. I know uh, one of our members um, has mined up, uh, up until last year, I think, with hydropower. So actually, we have a lot of hydropower in Austria, so it would be an opportunity. But to be honest, I don't know how many people mine in Austria or companies. And um, nowadays, I think like in every country, most people here um, in Western countries just exchange their euros against Bitcoin. Some of them, like me, I try to earn Bitcoin, but I think that's really more the enthusiasts and really the people who are really into Bitcoin. I think here in the Western world, most people I just want to buy it, hold it and speculate on it. Are you familiar with BitRefill? Yes, I am. Okay. I'm a, I'm what, a user. <laughs> ah, okay, perfect. Then th you'll be able to answer this next question. Um, what are the most useful bit refill gift cards for Bitcoiners located in Austria? Um, there are a few, like the Amazon uh, card. I'm, I'm uh, mostly exchanging Satoshis for uh, Amazon uh, points, like to buy stuff there. And um, I think we also have a, like a retailer for electronics and... Um, shops for outfit um, uh, where you can like exchange your satoshi or ether to 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 um, money in a way like that they accept yeah so yeah, that you can use your bitcoin to buy stuff yeah and yeah i i i think it works great it's com totally easy and um it's the easiest way for me like to change the tips i get sometimes um to buy stuff with it yeah i want to kind of change the subject here Fab was saying that you spent uh, some time in Africa. Can you tell us what Bitcoin adoption looks like on the ground from your experience? Yes. Yeah, so I have been to Zimbabwe last year in January before the COVID pandemic breakout. And I went there to study actually the, the way how people use uh, Bitcoin there because we always say, oh, Zimbabwe and like Argentina, Venezuela are countries where Bitcoin is really needed. And I wanted to take a look at that if it's true and uh, how far the adoption um, has gone. And I mean, Af Africa is huge. So you can't actually say in Africa in general, but uh, in Zimbabwe, for instance, usage was not really big, I think, because people have to get used to it. Um, they, most of the people use their phones um, to buy stuff with uh, EcoCash, that's like uh, M-Pesa in Kenya. So they are used to use their smartphones or their phones for buying and exchanging uh, stuff. So most people I spoke with already knew about Bitcoin. So everybody knows about it. And I did a talk there and to, to like show the people what Bitcoin is. And as soon as I told them it's unconfiscatable, it's non-inflationatory, everybody understood and knew I want that thing, yeah. So, and I've heard, I did an interview recently with a friend of mine in, in Zimbabwe and she told me that the, the adoption is growing. So Africans were scammed a lot and still are being scammed a lot. But I think the more education and the more adoption is going on, um, this is like, like, like this network growth is, is, is uh, growing, yeah? Um, like from, for instance, in Nigeria, there's also like 20 to 30% inflation per year. And also in Zimbabwe, people know 
on the one hand, the US dollar is interesting. They need, they want US dollar because compared to their national currency, it's stable. And also Bitcoin, I mean, it's not only stable for them, the volatility in Bitcoin is for them, yeah. I mean, they can lose so much money with their own uh, currency that Bitcoin for them in the long run is always still a huge uh, increase in, in value and it can't be censored. And we, may, we should not forget that in Africa, in most of the countries, the banking system is not really working. So they have banks, but, mo but most of the people don't really have access because they neither have an ID or um, they are, the next bank is so far away for them uh, that they can't even reach it and they don't have money. So most banks are not interested in them as customers. And that's a reason why, why Bitcoin is really needed in Africa. And um, you can see it that uh, people accept it and use it because in Nigeria, there was a survey last year and 30% of the uh, people said, yes, I already used or owned cryptocurrencies. And um, just recently I watched, I Took, uh, I looked at the numbers uh, on useful tulips, which is the, the aggregation of data from Paxful and local Bitcoins. And it shows that in, in the sub-Saharan area, uh, the increase in trading volume in some countries is 6,000%. So people really start to use Bitcoin. And I think if this ball you know, is like rolling, it keeps on rolling, rolling, rolling. How would you describe uh, the differences in the use case for African Bitcoiners versus the like speculatory use case that you described for Austrian Bitcoiners? Of course, also Africans try and speculate on it. Uh, yeah, But um, most of them can't even save money. So for them, it's more a hedge against inflation and a tool to be even E able, excuse me, able to send money for outside the country, like from other countries, like remittances. Um, I think Zimbabwe had 1 billion US dollars sent back to Zimbabwe last year. Just imagine how much this is and how much people have to pay for these remittances, not only for the services, but also they at the bank they get um, the, the, the rate that is much worse, like less money for the national currency than they would get on the street for the US dollars that they send. So if they can get money from uh, abroad in Bitcoin directly to their wallets, they only need, they can go to their local trader because they all exchange basically peer to peer uh, on the ground. Um, so they have their Telegram groups and WhatsApp groups. And then, you know, you have a guy um, who exchanges uh, US dollar for Bitcoin for you. So it's actually much more a need for the people there. So it it's really helps them um, to, to be economically active, you know. Like also in Zimbabwe, you have capital control. So if you're an African business person, um, you cannot just send money out of the country to import stuff. You have to ask the central bank. And this takes you at least one month. And then maybe uh, the offer is not uh, standing anymore and such. So you have lots of lo lots and lots of red tape and, and lose a lot of money and time. And um, also, as I said before, most people don't even have an ID. So... They are not able to use banks. You've been mentioning how people are using Bitcoin. Have you noticed anyone using Tether, like the synthetic <laughs> US dollars um, in Africa? To be honest, I didn't ask really because I was only focused on Bitcoin. I'm sure that people use it as a medium of exchange, um, but uh, most people were into Bitcoin. Did you notice any sort of premium? on Bitcoin's price in Zimbabwe. I've read articles with, that say like outrageous prices in places yeah, like Zimbabwe. I've seen that too. Um, what I found out is that actually it's not really a premium in Zimbabwe. It's a, it's, it costs more because um, it, it's most of the time the exchange rate from Zimbabwe dollar to Bitcoin. And that's of course much higher because their uh, currency is so weak 
that people give you less Bitcoin for it. And that's why the price is higher. If you price it in US dollars um, that people also have of course, and use in Zimbabwe because it's a multi-currency country, um, then the price is almost the same as here. It's okay. difficult. It's difficult to get liquidity into the country, but if it's there, then uh, it's almost the same price. All right. And then again, I'm going to change the subject on you, but <laughs> I wanted to ask you about podcasting 2.0. Could you explain to our viewers what it is? Yeah. Podcasting 2.0 is basically a movement uh, that tries to uh, give podcasting in a way back to the podcast creators and hosts. Um, podcasting um, is in the, in the development of becoming coming so centralized and closed in behind walled gardens like music for instance is yeah so you have these big platforms uh, they have the right to sell your product your content and um, this kind of consolidation is also happening in the podcasting space but podcasting is basically a very um independent and decentralized medium. And uh, post podcasting 2.0 is a mov movement that wants to keep it so independent. So it's a independent podcasting movement that also tries to um, get listeners to like pay what they want for the host. Like if you value my podcast, then you can send me some uh, Satoshis over uh, the Lightning Network. And I think that's a great possibility for podcast creators to stay independent from advertisers and all those, like sometimes it's even censorship, you know, that, that that's the result of um, if you have sponsors. So it enables or should, the goal is to enable the podcast host um, to, to have his or her own community uh, who support the show. And that's possible um, now, first time basically in history through the Lightning Network. Podcasting 2.0 seems to be like one of the best use cases for Lightning Network and, and the programmable money aspect of Bitcoin. How has your audience responded to it? Oh, I, I have a tribe of like 40 people. So uh, it's great to have this connection between, because in the Sphinx chat app, you have a chat and in the chat is, is the podcast. So you can listen to it and you can discuss uh, the podcast in the chat. And at the same time, you can do like boost you know you can send a hundred satoshis if one uh, segment of the podcast if you liked it um, especially so I think it's a great way to communicate um, and um, I would say people who are really the early adopters of uh, the lightning network and bitcoin are really into it and like it a lot yes do you feel the lightning network's uh, user experience has improved enough for normal people that aren't early adopters to, to use the value for value concept? Yeah, I think um, now there is the Breeze wallet, which uh, enables you to really easily send Satoshis because the Sphinx chat app, to be honest, it's still a little bit complicated because also as a user, you need to run your own node. I mean, you can lease a node from Sphinx, um, but it's not there where it should be, you know? It, I mean, it's really just uh, cutting edge technology. It needs the time to be developed and improved, uh, but it's on a, on a good way. And um, so with the Breeze wallet, it's also possible that you listen to podcasts and at the same time stream money. I actually just heard about Breeze's edition of, of podcasts. Besides Sphinx Chat, Breeze and Satoshi Stream, what other podcasting 2.0 apps should Bitcoiners be on the lookout for? I think Podfriend podcast app. Uh, so there's a podcast player called Podfriend, um, which is also already implementing the value tag that you need for sending Satoshis. Um, I haven't used it myself, I have to say, but I think it's also a easy uh, method. And um, uh, Castopod is also very interesting uh, from the perspective of podcast hosts because they uh, want to be a decentralized podcasting platform because most podcasters are podcasting on Anchor or Spotify and these are again centralized um, companies. So Castopod is also something where people can look out for the developments. Have you heard of John Carvalho's funding model for his podcast, The Biz? It's very similar to, to the podcasting 2.0 
uh, model where he basically allows his listeners to crowdfund um, with Satoshis to unlock new episodes. Yeah, I've seen it. Um, I mean, he, the process is a little bit different because he basically uh, lets people crowdfund, as you said before, and then he opens the episode for everybody. And with Sphinx Chat, you pay as you go, so as you listen, if you want to. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the concept is a little bit different, but in the end, yes, he's also enabling payments over the Lightning Network for podcasting, yeah. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about living on crypto in Austria that you'd like people to know? We were just talking about John Carveo's podcast. I just started uh, to use the Ellen URL um, QR code for my uh, podcast. That's an additional uh, experiment in a way. So I have a QR code now in my videos and you can send Satoshis there too. Um, so there are a lot of um, new developments like Ellen Bits and Ellen Pay and yeah, it's very interesting to try them out all, yeah. So, and um, about crypto in Austria, Bitcoin on Austria. No, I mean, what I, from my personal perspective, would like to uh, add is that uh, my new book will be out in July and it will be called uh, Learn Bitcoin with the L in brackets. And I will also include most of the things we were just talking about. So how can content creators uh, earn Satoshis? Um, how can people who want to start using Bitcoin, um, which wallets should they use? What's the best way to secure the coins? I've also included BitRefill as a great method um, to, to um, like change, exchange the earned Satoshis to, to, to be able to buy something. Because what I want to add, um, I was, when I was in Zimbabwe, I showed people how to earn money in Satoshis over stack work. I know, don't know if you know stack work. So um, then they had these Satoshis in their wallets and could immediately uh, exchange them for mobile points in Zimbabwe. And I tried it and I was fascinated because it, it, it worked without any problem. It was fast and um, super reliable. And I think that that's really great. Yeah. I think um, uh, platforms like Stackwork, which allow you to earn sats for micro tasks, are going to be huge in developing uh, nations like Zimbabwe exactly. and Latin America. Is there anything else that uh, you'd like to add about Bitcoin in Africa or podcasting 2.0? Yeah, what I would like to add is um, that we we here in the Western countries, we should have our eyes open and ears open um, for all those use cases the, that are really, really, really important. Um, like, look out from, I mean, we, we here in the Western countries, we live a very privileged life. Um, many people say Bitcoin is a like e ecological disaster and therefore we should ban it. Uh, but all those people forget those billions of people who really need Bitcoin, uh, whose lives could be really improved. And that the, the, the humanitarian si side of Bitcoin is for me the more interesting and the more important one. And I think that's one thing um, I want to yeah say and and also podcasting 2.0 if you like to listen to podcasts if you like to experiment with the lightning network it's really easy with the breeze uh, wallet to send some satoshis anita thank you very very much for uh, agreeing to do the interview and for answering all my questions i really appreciate it <laughs> thank you very much ricardo for the invitation i enjoyed it